Yang pertama, Dr. Maslima Malik, the former Minister of Education and MP for Simpang Rengam, Dato Dato, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very delighted to welcome here the former Minister, Yang pertama, Dr. Masli, to be with us here this afternoon, taking time off from Parliament to be with us to address the summit today. As we all know, when he was Minister of Education, Yang Bohamad Dr. Masli was uh, approachable, a dynamic, young, vibrant minister who has um, blazed several trails and have set up the National Economic Advisory Council, which uh, our Dr. Satina and many other friends have been a member of. And we do hope that you would be able to share with us your reflections on education, where do we go from here, as well as to share some insights with us as to how institutions of higher learning can cope in this post-COVID environment. So your thoughts as a scholar, as an academic, and as a former minister would be very useful for today's conference. So without any further ado, may I now invite Yang Bohamad Dr. Malik to Mantra Masli to give us the special keynote address. Yang Bohamad, please. Uh, salam alaikum and a very good afternoon to everybody and salam sejahtera. Uh, is this salutation for me? Okay. Yang Muhammad, Datuk Dr. Yusuf bin Yaakob, Minister of Education and Innovation Sabah, I have not been doing this for the last how many months anyway. <laughs> ah, Tan Sri Dr. Michael Yeo, Associate, Associate Professor Ella Solan Mohan, President, National Association of Private Education uh, Institutions, Datuk, ah, my old friend, Datuk Paramjit Singh. Is he around? So I suppose this one is for the previous session, not now. Okay, they have love already. Okay, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, and dear educators and teachers. Okay, uh, I would like to open my speech today by a quotation that I took from my favorite author on education, uh, Paulo Freire. He said, a humanizing education is the path through which men and women can become conscious about their presence in the world. Let me repeat that again. A humanizing education is the path through which men and women can become conscious about their presence in the world, the way they act and think when they develop all their capacities, taking into consideration their needs, but also the needs and aspirations of others. Talking about humanizing education was rather interesting. I still remember when I was in uh, Qatar, I was interviewed by currently controversial uh, news channel, Al Jazeera. <laughs> they did ask me about uh, uh, what is the purpose of education? Uh, it was in Arabic, so I did answer to them saying that uh, the very utmost goal of education is to li ansanatil insan. I mean, or in English, it sounds to humanize the human being. The major purpose of education is to humanize individuals. So, it started from there. We had a very long interview, but I'm not sure whether the long interview had been cut short or the whole has been included. But what I could trust Al Jazeera, they normally will take all the interview with them. They didn't hide anything, and that's why they have to pay a lot of price everywhere. Talking about humanizing individuals through education, it just reminds me of uh, one of the a uh, lot of things that we have done uh, in my previous life. I could see some 
old friends of mine in my previous life uh, before I reincarnated into a new person now in the parliament being the opposition okay we we did introduce the the fourth m after the three m's that was uh, introduced as part of the uh, let we say the the philo philosophy of our education dulu uh, i mean in the past we were introduced to the three m's if you still remember membaca menulis mengira it was based on that that we put a lot of emphasis to make our children are exposed to membaca menulis and mengira so we found that if we are serious about humanizing individuals humanizing our citizens we must not neglect the fourth m which is manusiawi or uh humanization to turn individuals more humane to turn them into a more a more human human being so it's all about values so i'm fully aware that now they will talk about education people are talking about i mean it came into my mind uh what have been uh, explained by Yuval Noah Harari in his book 21 lessons for uh 21st century or whatever i read that book 2 years ago when he was oftenly quoted when he said that in the next 30 to 40 years a lot of jobs will be different from whatever jobs we have nowadays and a lot of jobs nowadays will be extinct then so our education system should be prepared for that and we should prepare our children for that situation so when people when people talk about tvet education talking about higher learning education even when they are started talking about preschooling they will take this as their compass this as their bearing to set their ship to sail to the right direction so they say that okay we must prepare our children with ir 4.0 literacy they must be equipped to be data analysts they must be equipped to be robotic engineers these and that but they forgot to talk about one thing you can be a good robotic expert or data analyst whatever you want to become without values you be just another destroyers of the humanity you just be one of those thieves and robbers and kleptocrats with high position maybe in a country maybe in your own companies in your multinational companies that is the result of education without values this is where in my previous life among the first things that we embarked with was to reintroduce civic education it's not only being embedded in one subject called uh, uh, pelajaran moral or pendidikan civic no it should be taught and it should be introduced not only in one subject but also across the subjects across the curriculums and also in co-curriculum and extra curriculum i'm not sure whether it is still there i think i will ask the minister in the parliament afterwards that what opposition normally do but this opposition <laughs> this opposition mp has a better privilege because he can ask them whether they have executed whatever he has planned in the past <laughs> but anyway so humanity values is rather important and by looking at the theme of this conference i mean a couple of days ago <clears throat> i was busy establishing my new office <clears throat> after we moved from the old office so i found this book it was written somewhere in 1993 by hamish macrae it's not a famous author but the book it then was called world in 2020 i'm not sure whether you still remember that book hamish macrae world in 2020 so i began to reread 
not the whole book. Definitely, I didn't have time have to prepare myself to grill the ministers now. But what I found there, the author only write in one thing, that China is going to be the next uh, big economic power. But that was written uh, uh, 30 years ago, and COVID-19 was never expected to appear. So when COVID-19 appeared, it changed the whole, let we say, uh, way of life that we got used to and the whole world population got used to. We have been uh, pushed to rethink, to revisit and to reprioritize our life. And this is where I think when we're talking about education, it is rather important to look into those disruptors and those new events that change the whole, let we say, uh, lifestyle that we're familiar with. So talking about education, uh, in the year 2020, in Malaysia, not only we were caught with surprise, with, unexpect, with some unexpected events like COVID-19, but also we were caught with surprise with the change of government that we never thought of. I'm, I'm trying not to talk much about politics. It's all about education, but I mean, but it has a very significant high magnitude of impact on the way how education will be in the next five, 10 or maybe 15 years ahead. And it requires from all parties to revisit whatever they have planned and for them to reprioritize and realign <coughs> to a better sustainable post-pandemic world. Whether we are ready or not, I mean now people started talking about what is going to be to our educational system, the way we teach, the way we learn, and etc. And I'm not talking only about the uh, technological part of it. I'm not talking about the hardware part of it, but also the software. The other day I had uh, a very, excuse me, exciting uh, conversation with young people. They have established on their own what they call as Parliament Digital Anak Muda. It's a virtual parliament initiated by young people. So, instead of asking me about how parliament works and how, you know, politics works, I think three quarters of the discussion is all about education. So, I did tell them that, you know, the, the future of education after the pandemic will depend a lot on how we, human beings as a whole, the world population, look into life. I told him that everything will be more inward. You're talking about new industries mushrooming, a lot of archaic or maybe old businesses going to extinct. You're talking about agriculture making its coming back, but with a new form. So. I did tell him about, uh, tell them about uh, the micro agriculture that will be mushrooming, just like now we are having micro businesses, online businesses that are mushrooming, delivery service, health service, healthcare. And nowadays, if people are talking about e hailing, people are talking about Grab, Uber, and whatnot, the gig economy, you will find that in health industry too, uberization of health industry. People are more concerned about health. In his book, Homo Deus, Yuval Noah Harari talking about the life expansion of human being that's going to be extended in the future because, you know, science will help human being to find ways not only not to prevent death, but to delay death and try to cure a lot of uncured diseases in the past. Not only that, the post-pandemic world 
we would see everything will be more micro. Life will be more inward. People will be, will be taking care about themselves and their family. And new businesses will emerge. So I told them that agriculture is good, but don't think about a mass agriculture, um, mass farming, like we, what you have in the past. People we go more on mic micro farming. People will go on community farming, community farms, instead of only one person owning how many hundred hectares or thousand hectares. One company you know, owning a huge portion of land. No, I told them that that's not going to be the, the future of agriculture. It's going to be more digital. It's going to be more micro. And people will make full use of this online businesses. And the same goes with education. People will have less trust on each other. You know, the, just now when I met Max, we have met each other before, uh, he wanted to shake my hand. And then I show him my fist bump, my, my, my fist. Bukan nak tumbuk dia. But this is the new normal. Why? Because we we lost trust on each other. I don't trust you that you don't have COVID-19. There is 92.5 possibility everybody is carrying COVID-19 virus. So in order to avoid that 92.5, that's only my figure, don't trust me. I'm bad in arithmetic. Okay. In, in, in order to prevent that 92.5%, according to my, me, uh, virus from infecting me, so we just do the fist bump. This only, I need to wear masks when I see others. We need to have the SOP, social distancing. Why? Because we have less stress on each other. How to build back this the confidence? How to build back the trust that we have lost? To be honest, we lost trust on, on everybody. Not on a bad manner, but in a more scientific manner. I mean, we, we cannot just meet each other, greet, hug, and just what we did in the old days, we're not allowed to do that anymore. And why we need to put on the face mask and whatnot? We lost trust. Not in a bad manner. I, I think you, you, you know what, what I'm the points I'm trying to say. And this requires new technology to emerge. But again, when we lost trust in this part of life, the other part of trust will re-emerge. Uh, sorry, will, will emerge. But let's not talk about that. Let's talk about education. Uh, thank you to the organizer for inviting me to share some of my thoughts. And, you know, this post-pandemic has pushed me to revisit everything that I used to believe in. Uh, this conference supposed to take place somewhere in March, April, uh, somewhere in April. So I still remember, then I was rather new leaving my office. I prepared a, a speech just like I did in the previous live and, you know, to, to, to talk about certain things, to make it politically correct and whatnot. But, and then the PKP came, the MCO, the pandemic happened. So I began to contemplate on what really happened and what is going to happen. So I say, no, whatever I've written is useless now. So I just need to wait what will happen. I mean, just play by the ears. So to be honest with you, what I'm going to share here was a result of my contemplation that end yesterday or last night. After looking at what really happening around the world and what happened this afternoon anyway. Okay. After the 20 years in academia and civil society and after 20 months being the Minister of Education and after 20 weeks of the MCO and pandemic, I begin to realize that there are things that we should be re-look into when we talk about education. 
Uh, in the parliament, I met with some of my former officers, uh, talking with them, saying that, is there anything new in MOE? They said, no, I think they are busy coping up with uh, the post-pandemic school opening, which, if you ask me, I said that it, it was rather late when we opened the schools and the way we opened the schools, uh, you know, that's my personal opinion. We should be less centralized. We should, if you ask me, if I'm still the Minister of Education, what I will do then, I will empower the school leaders and PTAs and also the community to decide on their own. They know the best about their schools. They know the best about their students. They know the best about their community. Still remember those days when I visited schools at Pulau Bum Bum, at uh, Skola Orang Asli, somewhere in, in, in Pera, and few schools in Sarawak, in rural areas. Some of the schools only consist of 25 students. Some of the schools only consist of, you know, less than 50 students. And it's situated in certain islands, situated in certain place that everybody knows who's coming in, who's going out. And it's green area. They should be allowed to start their schooling even during the MCO because nobody coming in to their place. That's my, my only opinion. And you're talking about people, are, because people are complaining about the online education. They say that, oh, schools at rural areas cannot uh, really enjoying the online education because the connectivity was rather weak. I said, so why don't we go back to the conventional way of teaching and learning? Let people, let the children come back to school. But with the concession from the PTAs or PIBG, the teachers, the community, KKM, and also the PBT. Because education requires a collective effort by all stakeholders. We cannot only leave it to be decided by a group of people in Putrajaya. They may know certain things about schools at Putrajaya or KL or maybe IPO or JB. You know, they don't really understand every single detail of schools all around Malaysia. So this is where I begin to realize the post-pandemic schooling should be autonomous. Schools must be empowered. School leaders must be empowered with more power to decide on their own, provided they must consult the PTA, the community, and all agencies involved. By doing that, I, say, I think, and I strongly believe, we can overcome the, I, the, the, the issue of online learning. And number two, I didn't hear anybody talking about Campaign Malaysia Membaca, the national reading campaign that will launch somewhere in 2018 and 2019 when we were all locked down, when we were all being locked down in our houses, I was interviewed. I thought, what is the way forward? Because not all children enjoy the privilege of having devices for the online learning. I told them, we should come back to the very primitive way of learning, which is reading. All schools must try their best to send their books to their children. All uh, community libraries, all Perpustakaan uh, daerah must send books to houses. We must spend on that. <clears throat> I still remember people were talking about university students going back home, and some of them need to climb the trees in order to get good internet connectivity because they couldn't get access to internet to allow them to attend their online classes. So uh, the other day I did answer this in uh, in the parliament. I tried to answer this in the parliament, but I didn't get the chance. So I made a, a recording video talking about it. I told them it's not about online classes. Online classes for university students is only one tiny part of the whole idea of the online learning. The most important part is the content. If we don't have good content, it will defeat the purpose of online learning. 
thanks God that throughout the MCO, how many months we have gone through the MCO? The lockdown is two months, two or three months approximately. Three months, okay, three months. I've managed to enroll in many online courses organized by Ivy League universities and my alma mater, Durham University, and also Australian universities. All those free online courses and also the paid online courses to get the certificate. And by doing that, I can accumulate all the credits and all the hours to be convert should I join them to enroll in a more serious program. For, for example, to get diploma or to get uh, even degree. And this is the way forward, the micro-credential. And I was, I mean, we did that as part of our, I did that, we did that. I mean, we, we, we did try to embark with that uh, as part of our MOOC program, MOOC. And if not mistaken, that was part of our effort to, to, to turn our teachers into scholarly teachers. Because we believe that everything starts with quality and we need quality teachers to, ch to teach their children with quality teaching. So how to make our teachers scholars? It is through teachers' trainings, it is through online learning, and it is through micro-credential where they can uh, learn by their own, at their own pace, and eventually they get all the accreditation from the Minister of Education. So this is where, when I started enrolling myself into all those online courses, I found that the contents were rather fabulous. You know, some of the contents, you can download them. So when you, if you have the opportunity to come to a place with a more internet coverage, you can download them. And with, when you're offline, you can still follow the lesson. What happened now with our universities and most of our lecturers, for them, online learning is all about online classes based on their own convenience and not the student's convenience. So the students were complaining about the time. Sometimes some of the students need to attend from 9 to 4 in front of their laptop. I and mean, it's totally different. You know, when the, the, the normal schooling days, the normal, the normal days, yes, they need to attend classes in the universities, but it's different. You need to walk from one hall to another, from one lecture room to another. But now, because of the idea of online classes, they need to sit in front of their laptop for a good how many hours. It's very boring. <coughs> to, to be honest, it's very counterproductive. So what really happened with the Ivy League University's online courses and all these developed countries' online courses is the content. It was very creative, interactive, and interesting. You, you, you won't be boring, you know, when you uh, engage yourself with all those content. This is what we're lacking of. So I did propose to the Minister of Higher, Ministry of Higher Education if we cannot develop our own content, let's make a collaboration. Because I, I know that there are few IPTS, like Taylor's, I'm not mistaken, OUM, and few other universities, they already have their own contents. So for our public university, they should work together amongst themselves or with those universities that already have contents, they can share the contents or they can buy the content they want. Okay, if we don't have sufficient contents, from within the country, this is where they should work with universities abroad in order to develop content. And if they are teaching things that they couldn't find any contents from the neighboring uh, institutions or from other universities and they need to develop by their own, they need to engage with consultants. They cannot leave the lecturers only to stick to the online classes that they taught that is the online learning. So I think this is one of the examples that uh, 
we need to rethink about the way we, we, we approach. But again, uh, if you ask me what is the way forward of, for education in Malaysia, post-pandemic and post-2020, uh, I would like to lay down the seven major principles as a way forward for our education system. Number one, first and foremost and the last, it must be a value-based education. To humanizing individuals, that should be the utmost uh, reason for education. Education is to instill values within the hearts and soul of our citizen. Citizens without values are citizens that will destroy the country. And number two, there's a book. I, sort of, I, I really adore this book, but, but I didn't have the opportunity to bring it along with me. The, the, the title of the book is The Clever Nations. I'm not sure any of you have gone through that book. Uh, it was the journey of this author who happened to be a British teacher who's teaching in Canada and has the experience to live in some parts of the world. So she was doing her assessment on five clever nations or clever countries. Of course, on the top would be Finland. <laughs> Finland and Singapore and Canada, Japan and China. So it is a very interesting book, The Clever Lands, where in the book, he spent a lot talking about quality. Not only about teacher's quality, but also teaching quality. And also about the curriculum quality and school's qualities. I still remember when uh, I first came into the ministry, the expectation of Malaysian was very overwhelming, not only overwhelming, overwhelming, uh, overwhelming is very understatement, I would say was very, Tansri, what's the word should I use? Eh? Tansri, Azima, what the word, uh, Tansri Azima, soon you get Tansri. Dati Azima, what was the word we should use? Eh? The expectation was very gross, was very insane. And people are expecting us to change everything overnight. And a lot of people with different interests, either communal interests, racial interests, state interests, individual interests, group interests, keep demanding us for this and that. And as if when I come there, I'm having a magic wand, you know, to change things overnight or in a split second. I wish I had that one, but until today, I couldn't find it anywhere. So, and they forgot that structural change requires time. And Rome was, was not built in a day. Not even Putrajaya was built in a day. Uh, so, quality is very important. And we're talking about quality. I realized that it should come with sustainability. That's pillar number three that we should have in our education. Sustainability is very important in whatever we are doing. Sustainability of our teachers, of our curriculum, of our students. It must be there. So when you're talking about technology in education, it's only part of that sustainability to make sure that whatever we put in our system will be sustained, will last. This is where the IR 4.0 comes in. So it is totally wrong when people started talking about education and only focusing on technology and forgetting about the, 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 the very uh, root of it, which is to ensure sustainability in education. And pillar number four, when you're talking about education, is only it is not only the responsibility of the educators, it is not only sole responsibility of the ministry or the minister, but it is rather a collective responsibility of all of every single citizen. 
collective mobilization through engagement and cooperation. Uh, in, in November last year, it was in Dubai, there was a conference of uh, ministers of education. So I was among the panelists. So they did ask me how to ensure that whatever change and reform that we want to bring will be accepted by the teachers and schools. So I told them, number one, you must engage with the unions. In Malaysia, we have NUTP. Please embrace them as your friends and not as your enemies. So remember when the, when, when the first time they came to meet me as a minister, it was my second week in the ministry and some of the ministry's officers whispering to me, don't entertain them. Jangan layan sangat. Ngada-ngada tu banyak benda dia. Dia ngada-ngada minta tu, minta ni union. And look at the officers. Didn't they know that I was part of the union when I was in the universities? <laughs> I was part of the academic uh, association, uh, the presidents, fighting for the right of the uh, of, of the lecturers and professors and also the students. But anyway, please engage with them and they're your friends. And number two, make sure that you engage with as wide as possible stakeholders. It's not only the unions, the teachers, but also the PTAs, the school leaders, NGOs. That is where we got Datin Azima to join us in that uh, Majlis Penasihat Kebangsaan. Because I came from NGO background. I know we have a lot of things we want government to do. And this is where, for government, it is rather pertinent to take the NGOs to be part of the decision makers and to, to be part of the policy makers. The day where government believe that they know everything, they know the best, they, I mean, uh, they don't need others has ended. I'm sorry, it came back now. It came back. Yeah, it ended some months ago. But this is the future. For the Minister of Education, for the, for, for the government, they need to engage with as much as possible people. NGO is rather important. And another group that is rather important for them to engage with are the young, younger generation, the young people. I still remember the other day, I, I went back to Simpang Rengam, my constituency. I had the opportunity to sit down with a group of young people. They were talking about videos. They said that, oh, that's your video. Oh, you made it. Huh? So, you know, being a politician, talking about videos, sometimes scary and sometimes fascinating. If videos about others, especially our opponents, we'll be very fascinated. If our own video, we'll be, I mean, very scared of it. So, I approached him and said, hey, what videos are you talking about? He said, oh, it's a gaming video. And this guy is a, I mean, they were pointing at one boy, he said, oh, he's a famous uh, game YouTuber. A game YouTuber. I said, what, what, what is that supposed to mean? He's a gamer and he's famous on YouTube. Oh, he said, and he's from Simpang Rangam? He from Simpang Rangam. Oh, I'm glad to know that. I'm glad to learn that. But how in the world he got so famous? He said, it's through games. Games is a new lifestyle for the younger generation. When they talk to each other, they speak with game language that you might not be able to understand. And the other day, I had an opportunity to talk with Medeka Center uh, researchers. Ben, the director of Medeka Center, was telling me they made an opinion poll. They found out who are the most popular personalities amongst our youth 30 years old uh, 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 from, from, sorry from 18 years old to 30 years old within that range you'll be surprised number one a very well known gamer that I couldn't, re I couldn't recall his name number two 
another YouTube gamer who I don't know who he is is. And number three, another female gamer, a girl, YouTube gamer. It's very interesting. And number four is Ustad Abid Liu. So I asked Ben, Ben, where are the politicians? Oh, the most hated by younger generation. They don't trust politicians. What about me, Ben? Yeah, you're among the least. <laughs> you're amongst them. Okay, fair enough. So I need to turn uh, into gaming afterwards to create a new life, to reincarnate <laughs> into a gamer. Well, anyway, it was just a joke. But they have their own language. They know their world best. So in order to prepare a better future for them, you need to listen to them. You need to work with them. You need to understand them very well. If gaming is a new lifestyle, gaming would be a new means or the best means to educate them. If gaming is what they understood, and I, the other day on the breakfast table, I had a, a conversation with my own kids talking about gaming. And I was surprised. I was caught with surprise to know that even my children, they know about gaming. And for them, even my 11 years old son, he has his acquaintance and friends from all over the world that he managed to get connected with them through games. And talking about games is different from certain age to another and different from one class economy to another. You're talking about Animal Crossing, for example. Have you heard of Animal Crossing? Uh, it's, a, it's a famous Nintendo game. It's, it's only for Bangsa Bubble people like us. Because we have money to buy the consoles. PUBG ah, is famous among the non-English speakers. Dota, you know, those kind of games. And the, the talking about age, below 12, they're addicted to uh, what Minecraft and Roblox and all sorts of those games. So this is where, when I read some of the reports, in some developed countries, they're turning games as part of their, curric uh, not curriculum, part of the supporting curriculum. They allow their children to play games like Roblox and Minecraft in order for them to explore their creativity. So the other day, my son is only 11, but was referred by my daughter, a 20 years old daughter who's studying at Georgetown University, US, not Georgetown, Penang, when they were playing Zelda, one of the games. So, you know it? I heard somebody say Zelda. Ah, you know, Zelda. And I thought it's just only a game, but it's not. Yeah, a lot of strategies, a lot of riddles, and problem solving. Am I right? Uh, am I right? Yeah. So, it was very fascinating. And they learned a lot from it. So, this is where we need to engage with them. Pillar number five, continuity of education. You're talking about education, this is where my, my critic on this current demarcation between uh, Minister of Education and Minister of, of Higher uh, Education. For me, education should be one. It should be under one roof because of the continuity. If some of you still remember, I did talk about the idea of abolishing the examinations. Not only at the younger age, but also at the primary level and also at the younger high, uh, younger, junior high school. We should go to the big data and AI to continuous, co continuously evaluating our children throughout their works, their activities, participation, curriculums. We should have that data since the preschooling. Until they reach, until they, they, they finish their junior high school, and then we could determine which stream they're most, they, they, they most suited to continue their studies. Maybe they're good in TVET, despite of their how many A's they could get in their examination, but they're good in TVET. 
they should go to DVET. Some of them, you know, although they are smart, but they could be the next, the new Mozart. But normally parents will push them to take medicine. So you're killing their potential. And some of the children, maybe they're good in sciences, but they're not doing well in certain other courses. This is where we should make full use of big data and AI in order to, in order to avoid mismatching, misplacement, and also uh, what they call as the, the lost generation. Pillars number six is the equity in education. If you still remember, I talk about this a lot on zero reject policy. Zero reject policy, which we allow our children with disabilities to come to school. It's part of our responsibility and we should accommodate them. We should equip ourselves in order to allow them to explore their potentials. They're special children. They're very special that God has given them to us in order to unleash our humane within. And also access to education. You're talking about online education. Normally here, people will be talking about those who are with privileges living in uh, urban area who can get, get access to online education. But that is not the case in Australia. The one that depend most on online education are those who are living in rural area. Those Aborigines kids, they have these online classes and to expose them to the outside world. And I think this is the way forward. Those who are living in rural areas should be fully equipped with internet connection, with whatever means to allow them to explore the world. And number seven, pillars number seven as a way forward for our education is, education is holistic. We should take a holistic approach to education. As you remember the quotation, the an African quotation saying that it takes a whole village to educate a child, it, which is true. You're talking about uh, education, it should go beyond the four walls of the classroom and schools. This is where I still remember one of the things in the pipeline and got destined that we have not managed to crystallize it is the participation of uh, all retailer, not all retailers, sorry, all those fast food chains and supermarkets to be, to be part of the promoters of education. When we launch our Malaysia Mambacha, we managed to get Petronas, Shell, and all those corporate companies, even the fast food chains, restaurants like McDonald's and uh, KFC, we say that, why don't you help us to promote, for example, reading culture? And why don't you help us in promoting moral education? At school, with moral education, every week we are introducing new values. For example, this week we are introducing uh, the, the, the value of being honest. So all the activities at school, we will be focusing on the value of being honest, the examples they will learn in English language, in Bahasa, in, in whatever subjects about being honest. And not only that, we also want all the petrol cures, all the fast food restaurant to promote that together with us. Being honest. The following week, we're, we're trying to promote uh, respect your elders. So, and, and it goes on. That was my dream, but eventually it's not that easy. But I can see the level of success. In the 80s, when I was rather small kid in JB, we were exposed with the courtesy campaign launched by the government of Singapore. That uh, the, the picture of Kodomo, the small lion pro promoting courtesy. You could see on the, on the TV advertisements, a lot of good messages being sent. On, 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 on courtesy and how we should not, uh, how, on how we should give seats to the elders and how we should respect others, not uh, to, 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 to preserve 
the tidiness of our country uh, until the extent of not chewing chewing gum in public places in Singapore. One of the extreme example. Uh. But the very idea is the, the, the whole government uh, missionaries and ministries should get involved in education. And education should not only confine within the four walls of schools and universities. When you talk about education, it should include everybody and all ministries and all government agencies. I think uh, enough boring you guys. I can see I've taken a lot of time. Terribly sorry and apologies and terribly sorry to, to make you all uh, boring to listen to my rumblings but and uh, I think whatever it is when we talk about education we should know that education is a major commodity in our life and it's the responsibility of everybody of every single individual and education is the right of every citizen nobody should be left uh, from education and everybody should participate in educating their fellow citizens. I will close this uh, boring session of mine with two quotations from a famous... Uh, okay, you guess who, who's the person that I, co I quoted from. The first quotation, she said, it's a she. Alone, we can do so little. Alone, we can do so little. Together, we can do so much. That's number one. Quotation number two. This one I quoted in the parliament the other day. Although the world is full of suffering, although the world is full of suffering, it implies that she also experienced suffering. It is also full of the overcoming it. Although the world, uh, the, although the world is full of suffering, it is also full of the overcoming it. Guess. Wow. Respect. Helen Keller, who suffered a lot due to her disabilities, but she's the one that we look up most, especially in education and especially in special needs education. Thank you very much.